Hello, my name is Pam Tining and I'm with Progressive Architecture Engineering in Grand Rapids, the consultant to the Lake Lansing Special Assessment District Advisory Committee. This video slideshow is about how the size and shape of Lake Lansing affects its water quality. When we talk about size and shape, we want to put it into context. Just how big is big for inland lakes in Michigan? And how does Lake Lansing compare? How does the size and shape of a lake affect its water quality? Lake scientists use the word morphometry, which means size and shape. We can make measurements of both morphometry and water quality, such as lake surface area and shoreline length for morphometry, and temperature and dissolved oxygen for water quality. When we talk about a lake's morphometry, we're talking about the size and shape of the basin, or the hole in the ground, that was carved out by the glaciers 10,000 years ago. When we talk about water quality, we're of course referring to the water that fills that hole in the ground. In this slideshow, we're going to look at why the size and shape of the hole in the ground makes a difference as to the quality of the water that's in it. But first, let's look at the big picture in Michigan. Using information from Michigan's GIS open data, there are just over 10,000 inland lakes that are five acres in surface area or greater. Of those, roughly 9,000 are less than 100 acres and about 1,000 are over 100 acres. Lake Lansing is the 252nd largest inland lake in Michigan, which places it in the top 3% of those 10,000 lakes by surface area. This map shows the distribution across Michigan of inland lakes greater than 5 acres in surface area. Lake Lansing is shown as the red dot in south central Michigan. You can see where the glaciers left behind lakes as they scraped across the landscape. Some areas are very lake rich and a few counties have almost none. 10,000 lakes is too many to look at in any detail. So we'll pick out just a few for comparison to Lake Lansing. This slide shows the surface area and shoreline length for our lakes of interest. Houghton Lake is the largest lake in the state by surface area at just over 20,000 acres. Torch Lake is in second place at nearly 19,000 acres. For our small group of lakes, Lake Lansing is about in the middle, and the smallest lake in our group is Shoepack Lake at 32 acres. Even though Houghton Lake is the largest by surface area, it doesn't have the longest shoreline. The Michigami Reservoir does at 76 miles. Torch Lake, even though it is smaller than Houghton, has a longer shoreline because of its more irregular shape. Lake scientists use a formula called the shoreline development factor as a way of comparing shoreline length and surface area. If we resort our lakes of interest by shoreline development factor, now Houghton Lake falls to the middle of the pack. The lakes with the highest shoreline development factor have the most irregular convoluted shape, while the lakes with the smaller shoreline development factor are the most circular in shape. A perfectly circular lake would have a shoreline development factor of 1.0. Of the lakes in our group, Lake Lansing has one of the lowest shoreline development factors at 1.3. Using information in the state's GIS database, we can sort the list of inland lakes by shoreline development factor to see the biggest and smallest in Michigan. The left-hand column shows the top of the list, and the right-hand column shows the bottom of the list. If you look closely, you'll see that most of the lakes on the left-hand column are reservoirs or impoundments. That's because lakes that are formed by damming up rivers tend to have a very convoluted shape, while lakes carved by glaciers tend to be more rounded in shape. Smallwood Lake on the left-hand column and Lake 16 on the right-hand column are two examples at opposite ends of the list. Smallwood Lake is an impoundment of the Titabwasi River and has a shoreline development factor of 11.4.
Lake 16 is located in Delta County and is very circular in shape. Shoreline development factor is important because lakes that are more convoluted have longer shorelines and more coves and bays. This allows for more development along the shoreline and therefore a greater potential for pollution input from shore as well as a greater potential for more plant growth along the shoreline. In this slide, we compare Smallwood Lake, which is 371 acres in area, with Goose Lake, which has almost the same surface area shown here at approximately the same scale in the two photographs. But Smallwood stretches much further across the landscape because of its long winding shape, while Goose Lake is more compact and rounded. Lake depth is another measure of lake size. Torch Lake is the deepest inland lake at 285 feet, while Houghton Lake has a maximum depth of only 21 feet. Lake Lansing is about in the middle of our group of lakes with a maximum depth of 34 feet as shown in this Michigan Conservation Department map drawn in 1938. In 2015, staff from my office conducted a hydroacoustic survey of Lake Lansing in order to gather updated information about depth and vegetation in Lake Lansing. The survey was conducted by traversing back and forth across the lake while using downscan sonar technology. The survey allowed us to create more detailed mapping of the lake bottom and calculate a new average depth for Lake Lansing. Maximum depth is good to know, but it can give a skewed picture of depth in the lake. Average or mean depth gives a better overall idea of how deep a lake is. Not only is Torch Lake the deepest inland lake in Michigan, its average depth of 137 feet is deeper than many other lakes. Lake Lansing has an average depth of 8 feet. Depth is important for many reasons, but one reason is that it affects how and where plants can grow within the lake. Aquatic plants can grow to a depth of about 15 or 20 feet. So, with an average depth of 8 feet, Lake Lansing can support plant growth throughout much of it, the lake bottom. Lake volume is really the overall measure of just how big the hole in the ground is. You can see from this slide that Torch Lake dwarfs all the other lakes in our lakes of interest. It's large in all three dimensions, long, wide, and deep. And it's neat not just in one spot, but throughout the whole area. Houghton Lake is long and wide, but not deep, so its volume is not nearly as large as Torch Lake. In the lakes shown on this slide, Lake Lansing is again about in the middle. Volume becomes particularly important when we discuss the amount of pollution, like phosphorus, that washes into a lake. So, let's turn our attention from measures of lake size and shape to measurements that we can make of the water that sits in the basin. And, just like size and shape, we want to look at what's big and what's small or what's high and what's low when it comes to lake water quality. One of the most ordinary but critically important water measurements is temperature. At the low end, we know that water freezes at 32 degrees and our Michigan lakes do get to 32 degrees in the wintertime. At the high end, lakes in Michigan get to about 80, sometimes 90 degrees Fahrenheit but some lakes or ponds out west can get well over 100 degrees because they're heated from geothermal activity. But we don't have nearly that degree of geothermal activity here in Michigan. Our lakes are heated not so much from the earth, but more by the sun. Let's look first at a shallow lake. In the early spring, just after ice off, the lake is uniformly cold from top to bottom. The sun begins to warm the water. Because the lake is shallow, the warm water at the surface is mixed throughout the entire water column. So, by summer, the lake is uniformly warm from top to bottom. An example of a shallow warm lake is Houghton Lake, which has a temperature of about 70 degrees in summer from top to bottom. In a deep lake, the sun warms the surface of the lake, but the solar rays can't penetrate very deeply into the water column, so the bottom stays cool. Once the upper portion of the lake becomes warm, 
It mixes within that warm upper layer, but stays separate from the cool bottom layer. Torch Lake is an example of a deep lake that has a warm upper layer, known as the epilimnion, that is divided from the cool bottom layer, known as the hypolimnion, by the transition layer between them, known as the thermocline. Anglers often seek the thermocline since fish can be found there. Lake Lansing has aspects of a deep and a shallow lake. The deep holes are just deep enough to begin to stratify. The thermocline occurs at about 25 feet of depth, and the deep water is about 55 degrees. However, outside of the deep holes, most of Lake Lansing is too shallow to stratify and stays uniformly warm in the summer. Dissolved oxygen is another very important measure of water quality. Oxygen enters a lake either from the atmosphere or from aquatic plants that generate oxygen during photosynthesis. The amount of oxygen dissolved in water depends on temperature. Cold water can hold more oxygen than warm water. When temperatures hit their peak in summer of about 80 degrees, the maximum amount of water that a lake can hold is 8 parts per million. Under ice cover, a lake can hold 15 parts per million. Besides the maximum amount of oxygen that lake water can hold, there are high and low levels of oxygen for the organisms that live in the water. Trout and salmon, for example, are finicky and need relatively high oxygen levels of about seven parts per million to survive. If oxygen levels dip below seven for very long, then these fish become stressed and a fish kill can occur. Leeches and bloodworms, on the other hand, are very tolerant of low oxygen levels and can survive on as little as two or three parts per million of oxygen. Shallow lakes are usually well oxygenated from top to bottom because they are constantly mixing. Oxygen from the atmosphere, and probably also from aquatic plants, continually resupply the lake with more oxygen. Because shallow lakes are usually warmer than deep lakes, however, the maximum oxygen level in summer is usually around 8 parts per million, as is the case with Houghton Lake, shown here. The oxygen level in deep lakes can be a bit more complicated. With deep lakes, we can have two different scenarios develop in the summertime. One scenario where the deep water, or hypolimnion, is well oxygenated, or aerobic, and one where the hypolimnion is oxygen depleted or anaerobic. This slide shows two of our lakes of interest, Torch Lake and Paw Paw Lake. The deep waters of the hypolimnion in Torch Lake are not only well oxygenated, the oxygen concentrations below about 30 feet are even higher than they are at the surface. And that's because the cold deep waters hold more oxygen than the warm water at the surface. By contrast, Paw Paw Lake has about six parts per million of, of dissolved oxygen in the upper layer. Below 30 feet, the lake is nearly devoid of oxygen. Let's take a close, closer look at that. After ice off in the springtime, the water is cold and oxygen levels are high throughout the lake, represented here by the white bubbles. Windy conditions help to introduce atmospheric oxygen into the lake and the oxygenated water is mixed from top to bottom. As the water warms at the surface, it holds less oxygen. The deep water remains cool and holds more oxygen than the surface. In deep lakes that have abundant plant growth, plants and other organic matter die back through the summer and fall to the lake bottom. The bacteria that decompose the organic matter consume oxygen in the process. These bacteria live in the bottom sediments, so oxygen becomes depleted from the bottom up. If there is enough plant growth and dieback, oxygen can be depleted from the entire hypolimnion. Like with water temperature, Lake Lansing is a hybrid of its deep basins and shallow areas. The deep waters of the hypolimnion are nearly oxygen depleted. The shallow portions of the lake have high oxygen levels. Thus, Lake Lansing is suitable for warm water fish like bass and bluegills that tolerate the warmer temperatures and slightly lower oxygen concentrations. 
Another very important water quality measurement is a lake's phosphorus concentration. Phosphorus is the nutrient that stimulates plant growth. Phosphorus can enter a lake from the surrounding watershed, especially from sources such as urban storm water or fertilizers used on residential lawns or fertilizers used in agriculture. By contrast, lands such as forests and wetlands generally contain very little phosphorus in runoff and may even act as filters to remove phosphorus. Once phosphorus is in a lake, it can be recycled from the lake bottom or plants can recycle phosphorus by withdrawing it from the lake sediments and pumping it out through their leaves. The amount of phosphorus in a lake can be an indication of the lake's trophic state, that is, how biologically productive the lake is. Deep, clear lakes with little plant growth and slow-growing fish are called oligotrophic lakes and have phosphorus concentrations less than 10 parts per billion. Shallow, nutrient-enriched lakes with abundant plant growth and fast-growing fish are eutrophic lakes with phosphorus concentrations above 20 parts per billion. Lakes in between are called mesotrophic lakes. In Michigan, phosphorus concentrations range from very low to very high levels. The chart on the left shows data that was collected from Michigan Inland Lakes as part of the National Lakes Assessment. It provides a statistically valid assessment of lakes nationwide. In Michigan, most lakes are clustered at the lower end of the scale in the mesotrophic or moderate range. However, other data collected by Michigan state agencies, included in the chart on the right, shows that some Michigan lakes have phosphorus concentration over several hundred parts per billion. Within our small group of lakes, we have one shallow lake with very low phosphorus concentrations and one with very high levels. James Lake is located in the western Upper Peninsula and is surrounded by forested land. As such, very little phosphorus has washed into the lake from the surrounding watershed. By contrast, the land surrounding Thread Lake, located in Flint, is highly urbanized and it has a golf course at the south end. As such, lawn fertilizers and other pollutants are quickly transported to the lake through drains and pipes. Deep lakes can also have very low phosphorus levels, like Torch Lake, shown flipped on its side on the left. Pawpaw Lake, shown on the right, has moderate phosphorus concentrations in the upper waters, but notice how the phosphorus levels increase dramatically in the deep hypolimnetic waters. Let's take a closer look. In this series of slides, we'll look at temperature, oxygen, shown as the white bubbles, and phosphorus. As you recall, just after ice off, lakes are cool, well mixed, and oxygenated from top to bottom. As spring progresses, the water at the surface warms and begins to lose some oxygen. In deep lakes with abundant plant growth, bacteria in the sediments consume oxygen in order to break down and decompose organic matter. In the absence of dissolved oxygen, Phosphorus contained within the sediments is released up into the water column. Deep water phosphorus can increase to very high levels. Once again, Lake Lansing is a hybrid of both deep and shallow water. In the deep water, very high phosphorus levels have been measured, but the shallow areas, which cover a much larger portion of the lake, tend to have more moderate phosphorus concentrations. When we review data collected from Lake Lansing over the last 16 years, we get a picture of the lake's water quality. Median is the best measure of average conditions, and Lake Lansing's water quality is mesoeutrophic. That is, the lake is between a moderate and a highly nutrient-enriched lake. This map shows the location and height of plants in Lake Lansing. The blue areas have no plants, the red areas have plants growing to the surface, and the green areas have lower growing plants. As you can see, plants grow throughout most of Lake Lansing, which is a result of the fact that the lake is generally shallow and it contains sufficient nutrients to stimulate plant growth. So, what can we conclude about Lake Lansing? By Michigan standards, Lake Lansing is big. 
It's in the top 3% of inland lakes by surface area. It's shallow, with an average depth of 8 feet. Most of the lake is inhabitable by aquatic plants. The two deep holes are deep enough to stratify into a warm surface layer and a cooler bottom layer. The cooler bottom layer becomes oxygen depleted in summer, with a consequent rise in bottom water phosphorus levels. Outside of the two deep basins, most of the lake is shallow enough to maintain high oxygen and moderate phosphorus levels. Water clarity is very good, which helps rooted plants to grow. And grow they do. The Lake Lansing Special Assessment District Advisory Committee and the Lake Lansing Property Owners Association hope this information helps you to understand a little more about lakes in general and Lake Lansing in particular. Thank you for your attention and your support.